Long time, long time I haven't spoken to you. It's been a while indeed. It feels good to be back in studio with Certainly you. Certainly glad to have you. Giselle, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, so my name is Giselle Ramos. I am a social worker, certified mediator, and ICF trained certified life and wellness coach. And I am the owner of Ramos Therapeutic Consultancy. Um, my business has been operational for the past four years. We actually just recently celebrated our four year wow. anniversary of being in business and serving um, multiple populations, um, individuals, couples, uh, organizations, all of whom I feel very honored to be able to journey with. Uh, my social service agency provides mental health support as well as coaching support to my clients. Um, and it's, it's definitely been quite a journey. There's a big smile on your face. So, so let's talk a little bit about that big smile. What drove Giselle to go down this direction? When I met you, of course, as you said, you were in the social landscape. At the time, we were talking about looking after some elderly persons, some physically handicapped persons who either they were in sport or they left sport. And what, what has driven you in this direction? So you know that we don't say physically handicapped. Yes, we yes. say disabled. Disabled, yes. all right. So glad so, they corrected me, so let's say disabled. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so my career would have initially begun in the disability sector yes so i would have served with the national center for persons with disabilities for quite some time and then i would have pivoted into my own business mm. because i really wanted to be able to serve in a way that felt authentic to me and i want to also be able to tailor my services to meet people exactly where they are and that that's the freedom of entrepreneurship. That's the freedom of being able to own your own. And my certification allows me to do that. And so I have crafted several services that are now available to the public. And that really has taken it a life of its own. And so the reason for the shift really came essentially uh, when my mom became unwell. Okay. And I recognized that I did not know how to support myself in that situation. Yeah, my self care practices were very much surface. And so I recognized the importance of not just self care, but being able to create a system that is going to support me, not just on a day to day basis, but when adversity hits. And so I recognized that if that's something that I was struggling with at that point, and you know, from time to time you go through hills and valleys, and of course you experience different levels of adversity throughout your journey there are other people who are going through the same. And as such, I wanted to be able to support persons on that journey, their wellness journey, being able to help them create sustainable self-care systems that allow them to take a proactive opposed to a reactive approach to their self-care. In terms of starting off and going down this direction, let's first switch a little bit and talk about this whole question of social welfare. As you know, Anton Lafon, who is going to be with me tomorrow, has always been talking about these disab disabilities and the fact that we don't recognize them enough here. Mm -hmm. And also, Giselle, that many persons who have disabilities, they are, I don't want to say slow to want to come to the public or to come, they, they rather stay behind closed doors. How you deal with that aspect? So that's why for me it's important to meet people where they are at. Yeah, and because our system does not support persons with disabilities through our infrastructure, through our systems, it's difficult for them to feel encouraged to even engage any agencies, public or private. And so what I would like to do is really 
change that and create more of an inclusive wellness space, not just for persons with disabilities, but generally. When I started this business, that's where it started for me, you know, um, that's where a lot of my career would have been centered and so I would have started offering services specifically uh, to persons with disabilities. However, that has since expanded right, okay. and, and while I do still serve persons with disabilities because disabilities are not just physical or not just visible, we do have our disabilities that are not visible. Yes. And so I, I definitely have tailored a business that can support both populations. Are you in the business alone? I mean, of course, we're going to be watching. Uh, tell us a little bit about the, 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 other, the other members of your business. So I have a very small team with me. I am the lead human service professional at the business right now. So the services that are offered, and they're offered on a part-time basis because I am still very much full-time employed. Yes. Um, I have a very small team with me. I'm the lead human service professional. And outside of that, I really do just have support staff. So I have my, my amazing uh, communication strategist. I have my web developer. I have my social media person. Uh, so really, it's a very tight and small knit group. But we are making it work. How have you found the response? to your organization? In other words, has there been a, 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 a major response or are people being a little bit skeptical? Because you know a lot of people, this as you said, the disabilities that you can't see, people don't like to show, mm -hmm. obviously. Mm -hmm. So how have you addressed that area in particular? I believe that I've created a warm and inviting space for persons to feel comfortable to come in to share and not just persons with disabilities but generally you know when you are addressing mental health and wellness uh, challenges it is you asking persons to be vulnerable with you yeah and coming into a space to share how they feel the challenges that they're experiencing and then saying to you how can you journey with me it is not an easy task but definitely I feel as though I've created a very welcoming and encouraging environment for persons to come in. Clients who have worked with me will tell you, um, I journey with you. Yeah, I, right. you don't just come in and, and we, we do X, Y, and Z and, we, and you go out my door and once you're out my door, that's it, you know? I definitely have created a space where clients not only feel welcome within the virtual and the physical therapeutic space, but also just generally, just understanding that their challenges do not define them and that there is support that is available to them. All right, we'll take a short break. When we come back, I want to really dig more into the whole question about mental health because that has been something that has affected a lot of persons sports or otherwise mm -hmm. and you've heard a number of leading sport persons actually you know has simon biles would have come out recently yes. not recently but over, over time and spoken about it naomi osaka uh, you would have heard some of the tennis players a lot of, a lot of persons involved in sport of the, the pressure yeah. we've got with us giselle ramos we take a short break we'll be back Welcome back, welcome back. This is WESN Content, Capital Face of Sports. And we are talking uh, with Giselle Ramos, an, an expert. And we are talking with her, particularly now I want to center a little bit, Giselle, on this whole question of dealing with mental health. It has transpired in many sports persons, not necessarily in Trent Tobago, but I'm sure they are in Trent Tobago, who suffer from mental health. And not only sports person, the natural person as well. How do you all deal with that? Because first of all, before leading the question, I'm going to ask you, how do you know that or how can you tell that someone has mental problems? Is it so easy? It's not as straightforward as people think that it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for example, you have people who are walking around with smiles on their faces and they do have mental health challenges or they are dealing with some sort of mental health issue. And so it's not as straightforward as people think that it is. Yeah. Yeah? The support is also not as available as it should be because while mental health is such a 
key part of our human experience and ensuring that we take care of ourselves, not just physically, but also emotionally and mentally. It's not as accessible as it should be. And while yes, there are free services that are available, there are many who have concerns about confidentiality. There are persons who find it difficult to open themselves up to any sort of scrutiny from anyone really. And so they, the stigma that's attached to mental health, people prefer to, as, as we say, deal with it on their own. Hmm. Yeah? So what would be, when we, as we're talking and people are listening, and there may be persons who might know that they suffer from some sort of mental situation, how would you advise them to deal with that? First, the, the, the actual persons and maybe family members, because depending on their age, they might have someone looking after them or not. Yeah, each case may be similar, but each case is different. Okay. And uh, what I would advise persons is definitely there is support available. Whether you're seeking to go through the public or the private route, uh, there is support available to you there are options for you, please utilize them. Please reach out. There are free hotlines. There are, there are so many support systems that are in place. Um, while Ramos Therapeutic Consultancy is one of them, there are several, I can tell you, several colleagues of mine who have had the pleasure and the honor of working alongside who are quite capable, quite competent, quite efficient in terms of providing that mental health support. What's the biggest challenge in, since you've set up this, this organization, this company four years now? What has been the biggest challenge? The biggest challenge for me, I believe, would be the visibility. I okay. think that, and that access. So I think that persons do want the services. However, there is that barrier either through cost, and sometimes people think that cost is just isolated to the cost of the service. We're not taking into consideration the fact that this person has to travel, so that may be an additional expense to them. Okay. That person may have limitations as it relates to internet access, so entering the virtual therapeutic space is also a challenge for them. Access comes in different forms, and those limitations really do exist for many persons. What can you tell persons, as we have a, a, a look at, your, a, a, at a venue here, what can you tell persons that your organization, your company offers that would make them stand out? Okay, so Ramos Therapeutic Consultancy, as I would have mentioned earlier, is a social service agency that provides mental health support as well as coaching services. So I provide a counseling, a group both individual and group. I also provide coaching services and very soon we're going to be When you be say providing. coaching, what do you mean? You so self-care coaching. Okay, fine. Okay. Yes, and this is where I hold a space with clients so that we can journey together to a space from where they are now to a space that allows them so, to thrive. So let me ask you, this is a difficult yes. question here, Joseph. <laughs> How can someone know that they need that help? Because you, we are asking persons to look in, inside of themselves and admit mm -hmm. that there is something wrong. You are a human being, I'm a human being. Yes. It's very difficult for us to admit most of the time that we are, something is wrong with us. Mm -hmm. At least openly to others. We might, in a corner, with a couple of friends or maybe family say, you know, why should I? But to, oh, how, 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 how do you do that? That, that part I'm, I'm really trying to find. How can you convince someone and say, sir, ma'am, come and have a talk because there is something wrong. But you wouldn't know. So how, how does that work? Most people do know, and it's a mindset shift. Okay. Okay. Yeah? People are able to know the difference between when they are thriving and when they're struggling. Okay. They know, innately they know. Yeah? And it's about that being able to really have that hard conversation with yourself and say, listen, I need that support. I need that type of support. Yeah, and what we often find is that when persons do do their free 30 minute consultations with me, they've come to that space of, I need the support. So just like I may be looking at television and realize that I don't see the words as clearly as I used to, maybe I need to do something about this. The same way that we may think to ourselves, I've had a couple bad days. I find it difficult to get out of bed. I'm struggling to cope with, with balancing work and, and everything else that I have on my plate. 
maybe I need some support. Yeah. Now, persons may not be able to off the bat identify that coaching may be the support or I need to go see a therapist for support. Yes. But then that journey begins that journey of self-discovery, that journey of recognizing that this is my challenge and this is the solution that I want. Who can I engage to help me bridge that gap? So let me ask you another hard question. <laughs> Men or women, which one, well, we don't call the name, so which one, you, you, from your knowledge and your experience over the last mm -hmm. four years, which one, has readily accepted that there may be something wrong, easier than others. In other words, so basically what I'm really asking is if, they, if you have more men crying than women crying, for one or better word. Obviously. And the thing is, is that, and I want us to reframe that. Go ahead. When we say that, you know, recognize that something's wrong, it may not be that something's wrong. Okay. It may just mean I need some help with this. Okay. Yeah? Okay. I need some support with this. Women are definitely way more inclined to reaching out for support than I men so. than men are. I think so. But that's because men have been socialized a particular way and there aren't enough avenues that support men. Because Why you say that? because the socialization has been that a man is supposed to present in a particular way. And when he doesn't, there are all sorts of names to describe him. Therefore, he doesn't feel like he can. And there are many men who don't feel like they can. Yeah? We've been socialized that way. How you deal with that though? Because how, how have you dealt with, with men issues as a female? Men, I have several male clients who are actually one of, like, one of the, the populations, I would say, in terms of people coming to me, they definitely are way more consistent because okay. I feel as though once they find a space that they're comfortable in, they're going to continue. And once they find a, a service that's actually working for them, they're going to continue. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's about being objective. It's about treating the client and their issues and validating where they are and again, journeying with them through, through their process. In age, in age, so do you cater for a particular age? Must you be over 10 years, over 12 years, over 19 years? How does it work? So I actually deal with both children and adults. Okay. Right. Yes, um, more so children on the side of, I provide a psychometric testing. Explain that. So psychometric testing really is for children who are showing any types of flags or indications for autism yes. adhd yes. Uh, we also we do what we call a pre-screener and i also do a panel that provides you with the, an overview of where your child is at academically and as well as what are some of the possible accommodations that can be made for this child are you aligned with any of the schools that look after um, children in that category? Not currently, because okay. the school system does have a system of their own. Okay. They do have student support services, um, but there are parents who do engage me for the service from time to time. Have you found that area? Because that was, a, that was an area I remember in discussions in the past, particularly with dealing with Special Olympics in particular, mm -hmm. where we found that many youngsters who possibly could have participated in Special Olympics, their parents did not want people to know that their son or their daughter, their aunt, their, their, their nephew, their niece had that sort of Special Olympics qualification, so they rather them not be involved. Because yeah. the stigma continues. Yeah. You know, it's, the conversations need to continue to happen on a much more frequent basis. We need to. Are you seeing anything? Are you seeing enough change? You've been wrong. You've not been wrong alone, but you've been wrong in it for a while. Yeah. Have you seen the progression in terms of a positive change, or or people still hard to digest some of these situations? 
It's still hard. It's mm. still very hard. And again, it's because mm. that lack of support continues to mm. not be there. The infrastructure is not there. The conversation is not there as frequently as it should be. The accommodations are not there. The types of hoops that a parent has to jump through in order to provide that support for their child, to access that support for their child, it's difficult. It's difficult. So of course, you know, parents want to do their best, the best that they can do in order to protect their children from a world that continues to not acknowledge them the way that they should be acknowledged. Before we take a break, uh, do you feel that besides what you're doing, from a social point of view, are we doing enough as a country? No. <laughs> mm. There's still so much to be done so much to be done. Our system really needs a, a good um, look at what we're doing, really a proper, a proper assessment from the ground level, because that's where the real answers are. The parents who are unable to provide for their children, the parents who are struggling to meet appointments, the parents who have to wait six and seven and eight months to see a practitioner because there are no appointments available. How do you solve that? Because they're still not going to be able to find the funds, obviously, if mm -hmm. to, 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 and then their son or their daughter, given all that you've just said, is, is if things are not sort it out, things will not get better. Exactly. So I, I think that it starts when we continue to have these conversations, when we agitate for change, really agitate for change. Because while we talk about it, so we go on social media and we talk about it and we, we bring a certain level of awareness to it, there's more that's needed. There's so much more that's needed when we talk about agitating for change. All right, we're going to have a little change here for a short while because we have the news next at 3 o'clock. After the news, we'll get more information in the last part of this interview with Giselle Ramos. We'll find out where they are located, how we can access them, where you can get better information, what this is going to give you. All right, let's take a, let's take a short break. <laughs> let's go to the news. We'll be back. Welcome back, welcome back. This is WESN Content Capital Face of Sports. Much thanks to Naomi there with the 3 o'clock news. And next up, we have another female here with us, Giselle Ramos. Giselle, I know there is a retreat coming up. For those who are interested and want to get more information on your organization, tell us a little bit about that. Okay, so let's start off with uh, the retreat. A Different Approach to Self-Care is a one-day all-inclusive wellness retreat. This year, we are going to be at the San Salvador Estate in Grand Coover. It's going to be on the 26th of October from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And when we say it's an all-inclusive wellness retreat, we mean that. We are catering to all of your needs from the minute that you get with us to when you leave. It's going to be a lovely day with a host of wellness activities so we are going to incorporate three facilitated workshops by uh, we have miss amber alexis who is the cultural dietitian uh, you can find her on instagram we also have tna francis who is our human design coach and this year's theme Wait, what, okay so human design explain okay, no, i i i i trying to understand i, I could going, understand some of it but i don't understand human design we're gonna get back to the All human right. design part of it but those are the two ladies who are going to be accompanying me this year and i want to make special special mention of them simply because this year's theme we're going to be focusing on utilizing the natural resources that are here in the caribbean so that we can build our wellness practices around that so we have those three expert facilitated workshops we also have spa services we have catered breakfast lunch snacks for the entire day uh, we have two breakout sessions that people are going to be able to engage in. So it's going to be a lovely, lovely day at the San Salvador Estate uh, on the 26th of October. 
here um, and really the entire concept around the self-care retreat is that we are going to empower persons to really take a proactive opposed to a reactive approach to their self-care quite often when persons come to me it's usually after after something has happened or they are currently in crisis and so we want to move away from that type of approach and instead encourage persons to recognize that hey I can take care of myself on a daily basis so that I can better support my needs when that period of adversity or crisis comes yeah so um, for persons who are interested in attending the retreats, you can purchase packages. So we have three packages which allows you to kind of create your own wellness retreat experience. So we have three packages that are available. You can go to our website, www.theramostherapeuticagency.com. R-A-M. R-A-M-O-S-E, okay. therapeuticagency.com, so that you can see the packages that are available and you can purchase whether, purchase whether using your credit card or your debit card, it is available to you. So a little bit about Ramos Therapeutic Consultancy and how you can access any of our services. We are currently located in Cuba. We were in San Fernando, but okay. we relocated to Cuba, to Cuba recently. Okay. And so you can visit our website as well where you can get more information on all the services that we offer as i would have mentioned we have counseling we have coaching we have the retreats uh we have what, our blog what where days you or can, what times so all of that is available okay. on on the website when you go you can decide if you are interested in yes. working with me, the first step is always us booking a free 30 minute consultation. Okay. Okay. You can do that either through the website or you can call me directly. Uh, my number is 716-1113. Uh, you can also find me on Facebook, on Instagram, uh, but the website definitely is available for you so that you can take your time, go through the entire thing. There's so much information there. Is this the there. first time you're having this? No, this is actually our second okay. wellness retreat. Okay. Yeah, so it's our flagship wellness event for the, for the agency. How was the first time? The first time was great. We had um, approximately 10 persons in attendance right. at, the, at the first one. And that one was a really special one, apart from it being Apart from it being the first, it was also held on the family's estate. And okay. for me, I like to continue to root myself in my ancestors and, and my foundation. And so whatever I usually do, so my first photo shoot was actually at, at the estate. My first um, retreat was actually at the estate as well. So this year we're branching out a bit uh, so that we can accommodate more persons. How much are you catering for? Uh, have you decided, you and your team, Giselle, have you all decided? Are you all catering? Mm -hmm. In other words, is there a limit? Yes, there is a limit. We're, we're looking at a small group of approximately 20 persons. Right. We do have a couple seats that are already filled. So if you are definitely interested, there is still space for you. However, that space is limited. All right. So Let's go back to my question. My questions. Explain <laughs> what we did this human as you was explaining. So conceptually, human design yes. is not my thing okay. per se. Okay. Um, but a little bit about what human design is, it really is patterning your your wellness right. practices right. that and connecting it to your internal your internal pattern. So that we each have a pattern. Yes, and what she does is that she basically provides you with a wellness map. Okay. Yes, based on your pattern. Interesting. I, I like the nutrition part because, I mean, you know, we always hear a lot of about persons involved in nutrition, and we know that there's always this big, this major thing in Trinidad and Tobago that they say that the Trinidad and Tobago citizens don't eat well because we mm -hmm. have diabetes, we have high blood pressure, hypertension. I don't know that we are different anywhere else in the world because from what I've seen, I've seen, I've seen that all over the world when I travel, right? Yes. As the case may be. I'm not yes. saying that we, we are not, but I'm just saying that we are, we are no different. So going forward now, what can you tell us? Four years has gone. This is your fourth year. Yes. Where do you see you and your team going forward, Giselle? Going forward, 
I am forecasting that my team and I are going to be engaging with uh, many more organizations. Okay. Okay. Um, we want to be able to meet the wellness needs of uh, the population of Trinidad and Tobago, specifically as it relates to improving their daily self-care practices and shifting people into a space of um, helping them to recognize that once you are not well, you can't be well for anyone else. Yeah. And that's something that I share all the time. So it's important for, so for us, we are focusing on continuing to expand on the current services that we offer. So our individual counseling, our individual work with coaching, that's going to also expand. Come September the 2nd, we have a couple new of services that are going to be offered and I'm excited to be able to share that with the general public. But generally, we see ourselves really expanding into supporting persons on an organizational level, especially as it pertains to retreats. Do you see, do you, see you and your team outgrowing this one venue and maybe having another organization and maybe one day, Giselle going full time into this? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. We're definitely going to, to ensure that that's what happens in due course. As you go, what message would you want to send to people of trying to be good, those watching us, those watching us, whether on social media, on television, mm -hmm. or elsewhere, mm -hmm. what message would Giselle Ramos like to give on behalf of the institution that you're involved in? Ramos Therapeutic Consultancy would like to share with all of you that there is support available to you and that um, you can feel free to reach out to us even if it's simply to ask a question. I also want you all to know that if you are not well for yourself, you can't be well for your organizations, you can't, uh, you can't achieve the level of success that you would like to achieve if you are not well first. And so ensuring that you take care of you, that you prioritize the things that are going to fill you up and that are going to ensure that you are in a place that you're able to sustain yourself, then it's important that if you haven't yet, that you make a decision to move into that space. Uh, 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 one question has come up again in my mind. Have you found that there are persons who may not, I know you mentioned that you said that people will know that they need help, but there are, maybe there are persons who in denial, let me use the word in denial, mm -hmm. right? There are persons who are in denial. Have you found that there have been, there has been times in the past where family members have actually brought persons and said, do we think something is not right? And have, so what do you say to those family members who may be watching mm -hmm. a son, a daughter, a brother, a husband, a wife, a girlfriend, and saying something is wrong, but they're not willing to understand. Yeah. How can they come to you for you to intervene, when I say you, not you personally, but for your, for your organization to intervene to try to help the situation. Okay, so those are usually family interventions. Right, yeah. And those are one of the, the touchiest ones know, to deal with because we have yeah. someone who is resistant. Yeah. However, we do our best to deal with the facts of the situation and to follow all ethical and legal Sure, the legal and ethical framework in order to deal with those types of cases, yeah? So for example, if you have someone who is uh, a danger to themselves and someone else, you know, we have a proper protocol that we follow okay. in order to manage cases like those. Greatest success story, no name call, What's but for you and your organization, greatest success story over four years. No name, no name to call, no name, but you can call an incident. No name, what, we, what do you, success, success story. story that you would have found uh, in the four years, maybe you personally too as well, in terms of you directly involved in it over the four years, something that stands out for you. Well, it, as it pertains to Ramos Therapeutic yeah, Consultancy, yes, yeah? Yes, yes. Um, greatest success story. I, I don't just have one. I know, because, but give me one. But, I know but, if you have more than one, choose one. No, <laughs> You can only choose. No, I can't. And right. I, I'll tell you why I can't. All right, go ahead, let me hear. Because, again, every single case is different. All right, okay. And the transformation of that individual. So let me reframe the question <laughs> to make it easier for you. Uh, uh, one that's t not necessarily the greatest, but had left the greatest, because only one is like, it's like life. 
there will always be one incident that, that, that has left an impact on you as compared to another and another that has, has left an impact on you. Okay. So the, let, me, let me use that perspective. Okay. The most impactful... Go ahead, yes. ...experience that I've had thus far is being able to shift this individual mm -hmm. from the space of complete defeat to a space of thriving. Okay. Yeah, that person was able to really make such, an, such a positive shift. And I'm so, so, so proud um, to, and honored to be able to journey with them, but also to see them sustain that at, at, after, a after, after a year or so of, of us working together. All right. So again, as you go, how can they contact you and your team? They can contact us by reaching out to 716-1113. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and via our website, www.theramostherapeuticagency.com. All right, thank you very much, Giselle. We can keep in touch. You yes. let me know as we get nearer to the event in October again, that date. Yes, the 26th of October. Uh, we're going to be at the San Salvador Estate for a different approach to self care. All right, Giselle Ramos, you heard it here on WESM. We're going to take a short break. We will be back. Everybody from 40 onwards should be screened. Sure. As you get older, the incidence of cancer rises in men, mm -hmm. and in and you you do screening examinations to see if you could pick up the cancer early o'clock, so we could treat it and cure the patient. What's up, Doc? Every Tuesday and Thursday on WESN Content Capital. We are tackling the hard-hitting topics, some controversial topics, some topics we sweep under the rug. You don't always have to forgive in a relationship for it to move forward. If it is you are in a situation where you forgive the person, but to the detriment of yourself, what are you really doing? It is very uncommon for somebody in the younger age group to have dementia. Atheists don't not believe is that I can disprove God but you also can't prove God, so we can't have to steal, mate. You'll focus on the woman who's been the victim, right. or the man who's been the victim. We exclude the children. Folks are trying to study the underlying brain mechanism to figure out how does this particular disorder happen in the brain? How is the brain processing this? Don't worry about AI. Worry about humans working with AI. Are you willing to learn new skills to stay relevant for the future job market? That's the challenge that people are going to struggle with. All right. Much thanks to Giselle Ramos. As you heard, it's all on people. They have all the information. You just need to go to the website and get more information. And of course, this show, you can get more information if you call us here at WESN TV. But next up, cricket. Today is the finals of the women's CPL. It is also the start of the men's Caribbean Premier League. Earlier this week, we had the opportunity, while he was in Trinidad and Tobago, to talk with Dr. Kishore Shallow. He is the president of Cricket West Indies. There's a lot going on, whether it be Azim Bazarat situation, whether it be the CPL, whether it be the resignation of Johnny Grave, whether it be a new selection policy, whether it be cricket in the Olympics. It's a lot. So let's have a listen. And of course, welcome wherever you are. We have the opportunity today to talk with Dr. Kishore Shallow, the president of Cricket West Indies. Dr. Shallow, welcome. Thanks, Andre. Always a pleasure, man. Dr. Shalo, first question, as in Bazarat situation, where as in Bazarat is no longer the West Indies Cricket Board, Cricket West Indies Vice President, but there will be a new election for that position in September. And we have heard that he is the only one nominated. Some people are saying, why? Well, it's a waste of time. Tell us about that. Well, interesting um, indeed. Um, as you recall, the last election in 2023, March, um, 
when the there was the nomination initially for Azim Bazarad as vice president, um, one of the, the the nominee, I think it was Guyana Cricket Board actually, withdrew their nomination, and so there was the 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 the, the what I would say a, a protest somewhat then um, of the elections going ahead, well, the election for the vice president going ahead, and the returning officer at the time, who is an established attorney in Barbados, um, Gregory Nichols, he ruled that the election is still valid, and so proceeded, and as he would have won that election, with six votes, four members abstain, and two voted against. Um, the Ghana Cricket Board felt, you know, that, you know, it was an unreasonable decision, and so they challenged the matter in court. Over the last year, let me say, Andrew, Andrew, we have been, we have made several efforts with Guyana Cricket Board to come to the table and let us, you know, discuss and come to an amicable resolution that would not affect the organization, right? We still hold the view that this matter should not have reached any court. And for obvious reasons, for the same outcome that we anticipate now, that Mr. Maserat, if there was a, a re-election, he would be re-elected, unopposed. Um, as it seems at this point, he would probably be supported even stronger than at the election in March 2023. So in anticipation of that, we thought, let us resolve the matter. You know, election is only two years. Um, let us work together and so on. But they felt that and I mean, it is in their own, obviously, discretion. They thought it was best to ventilate this matter in the court. Um, the court ruled in favor, but quite frankly, oh, we did not provide a substance, probably didn't provide a defense at all. And so- Why, the, the, why, why, why? Well, it, it was for different reasons. I would say that maybe the matter wasn't taken as seriously as it should have been by our attorney. Right, and and so the what we also felt is that the the, the Guyana court, Guyana's court, didn't have the jurisdiction on a matter like this since we are obviously registered in BVI and our office is pretty, um, primarily in Antigua, that's where our secretariat is, our headquarters is based. So with that, we we thought, well, you know, this matter would have been probably dismissed and so on, but it was not. Um, in discussion that I had with Azim Bazarat, I we decided that it would be best just to put this entire matter to, to bed. Let us have the re-election. Re so even with the, the the outcome of the case, the rule and the court order, uh, Mr. Bazarat had already pended his resignation because he had to vacate the office in order to have a re-election. So he, had, he was already prepared. And in fact, he had already submitted the resignation Right, but then after with, with the court ruling and so on, it was deemed that you know we have to. It, it, it is more prudent for us to um, adhere to the court ruling since we are going to proceed with the election anyway. And so, um, credit to Mr. Bazarat, he was you know extremely professional about this. Uh, we had his full cooperation, and he vacated the office, um, agreed to a election, a, a re-election process. Which is in again, you know, conforming with our, our our constitution. Does it does the court ruling in Guyana lead to the possibility that West Indies, cricket West Indies could be challenged now anywhere in the Caribbean, Dr. Shallow, because of that? Well what that was one of our considerations for appealing. Yeah. And, and in fact, um, I think the deadline for appeal, well, we have appeal, but we uh, still consider whether it is... It, 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 because it, there's, it, there's, no, any, there's no precedent and, right. and law, that could, that could be but, dangerous. But, but, but it, it won't be dangerous because what this has done is it, it has sort, certainly created the opportunity for us to strengthen our articles of association, right? So we realize that there are clearly loopholes. Because, I mean, you could take a mockery of the, the entire system. It is a little loophole, if you want to call it that, that the situation could be such that any shareholder, right, could be even out of just mischief, right, uh, a deliberate attempt to keep someone in office, just withdraw on the day of an election, right? And so we have to strengthen our work 
Oh. So you're, work, you're all working on that? Well, we have to. We have no okay. choice at this point. So with such opportunity, we are going to engage our shareholders and we expect that by the by the election next year when we'll have the entire body together at the AGM, we'll have some amendments done. Were you surprised, even as a you, you mean Cricket West Indies surprised Dr. Shallow that Guyana didn't nominate somebody, seeing that they didn't want Azim Batra? I'm certain if they had, if they were able to, they would have. Right. Mm. What what this outcome of Mr. Bazarak being the only person nominated means is that he has the full support, at least by and large, he has the, the support of the board. Right. I would not be surprised if the GCB is not the only share member who is not in full support of Mr. Bazarak. Continue. We are talking with Dr. Shallow. Dr. Shallow, you mentioned earlier about the resignation of Johnny Grave. Uh, there's been some suggestion as you intimidated that you, not necessarily you, but he was forced out. How do you respond to that? I mean, Johnny has done seven years in the organization, seven plus years in the organization. He has performed well. Um, but well is, well is a kind of subjective terminology. Good? Is, is well, does well mean good? Well, yeah, well, good, yeah, we could take those. But um, we'll see at this point. You don't seem to be so, you, you don't seem to be so enthusiastic about his performance. Yeah, am I wrong in saying that or not? Well, I mean, generally, people think I, I'm not one to show my emotions, really. So, but how would you rate? How would you rate his work? The work he would have done over the seven years, honestly. I think he has done a commendable job. Okay. I think certainly Cricket West Indies would have enjoyed some successes. Um, certainly, commercially, um, or finances. Was it his decision, or or was he actually actually was it his decision? Um, it was honest conversations, you okay. know, honest conversation between Johnny and myself, you know, where he is in his career, you know, what the organization needs and so on. And I think we were able to reach the conclusion that you now is an appropriate time. Have not you all yet. started to look for anyone as yet? Not yet, not yet. I, I wonder if Andrew wanted to raise No, 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 no. <laughs> but I just wonder how it, it does it no, make no, no. sense to have nobody when he leaves? No, so we have a plan. And okay. the plan is that um, we, we recruitment for these executive positions, you know, they take a while. They take probably okay. about three months. So Johnny's contract, we extended it. It was supposed to be finished in the end of September. We right. extended it to the end of October. Okay, fine. Um, and then we'll start the recruitment in September. What we anticipate is that the, 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 whoever we find, unless it's a freelance consultant or someone, they probably may need to give the employer. Caribbean or outside the Caribbean, does it matter? It would be great to find someone in the Caribbean, but we're not limiting it to the Caribbean. All right. So we will give them, so we have a period. Uh, our anticipated start date is January 2nd for this new CEO. So he or she will have... What do you, what you and your team time. would like in that, that, from that CEO? You and your team? Because I know it's a team yeah. decision. So what do you and your team? Yeah, well, we, we want someone who is obviously very experienced in, in administration, um, business administration, ideally. Um, we will hope that they have international experience. And, you know, if they have experience in, these, in the industry of sport, then that would be a, a major asset, right? But certainly someone who could come and, and you know, work collaboratively with the, with the board and ensure that our, our policies are implemented promptly and it will actually punctually and so on. Um, we are quite confident that there are professionals out there who will be keen on this opportunity. Any other changes uh, do you expect to the, to the current executive? Um, we, we have a new commercial director who should be starting the 1st of October. We also have a new communication person, head. Um, as you recall, Philip Spooner would have, um, would, have, would have moved on as well. Um, who did you put? Have you all named the we, new we, person? We, we, have, we have named both the communication head and the commercial head already. We have identified those. Um, the, I won't give you names. I in fact, I think the release is going out tomorrow. Okay. Right? So I'll read communication. Yet. I could tell you she's a Trinidadian. Oh, in terms of the commercial? Com communication. communication. Communications? Yeah, communication is a Trinidadian, a young Trinidadian female. All right, I'll leave you to, you know, guess. Um, mm, I think I guess already, but okay. All right. Um, no, 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 all right. Then, Interesting. And then, and then the commercial director is the commercial head, sorry, is. is, is is I think a British citizen, so he will be relocated into the Caribbean and he starts on October 1st. All right. Is, is it fair to say that this in this year's second term, 
What are you seeing different this from... This is still my first time, man. Still your first? Still Why are you thinking it's your second? All right, no, no. Sorry. Second you could year. Be second year. Yeah, my apologies. Yeah. Second year. Sorry about that. My apologies. Second year. What are you seeing differently from last year? Um, well, the first, despite being there as vice president for four years, it, yes. still, it still takes time to for you as the president to impose your philosophy and leadership and how we want to see the the organization you know move forward in terms of the direction your direction and also establish relations um, with key personnel you know key stakeholders not only in West Indies cricket in the office but you know throughout the entire Caribbean and even internationally you know ICC um, colleagues and all those different um, dynamics so it was taking some time to appreciate the entire dynamics around cricket the good thing about being there, you know, for, for the four years previously as vice president is that you, 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 you probably get through all of that much quicker than someone else who, if they were to come from outside the organization. Um, so this year is more about implementation. We would have established all those policies and so on in the first year. Um, second year is about implementation. I think that we are enjoying some success. There's, even with the teams, right, we would have had a new coaches come on in the first year, right? Darren Sami, Andre Coley. Um, she, well, Darren Sami, I could see having success. I'm not too sure we'd see Andre Coley having she, so much she, success. She, she indeed with yeah. women and so yes. on, yeah. right? So we have these new personnel in place and it's for them to come in and understand what it is I'm anticipating or looking forward from them and so on. And we have achieved most of that in the first year. Now is for me to say, well, we need performance, you know? Um, so the, the coaches understand me. I, I don't directly, you know, communicate with them. So not frequently to say, well, you know, Andre Coley, we need you to do this, or Darren, so we need to do this because that's what the director of cricket is, is for. But I'm, I'm quite pleased. I think we could celebrate the T20 performance over the last year. I think we. I don't think people, there, there will be much argument with the T20. There will be argument with the Test, but I, I will leave that for Mr. Bascom, not you. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll be back. <laughs> Of course, welcome back. We are talking here with uh, the president of Cricket West Indies, Dr. Shalo. Dr. Shalo, I, as I mentioned, this is my opinion. Andrew Cooley hasn't had the, the, the best start necessarily to, to his test time. Yes, he would have got that drawn series against Australia. But since then, we've lost two consecutive series. Uh, one, a very tough series, I must say, against England. And then at home, we would have lost recently to South Africa. People have raised a number of questions, including on, on many of my programs as well, about Craig Braffitt. His captaincy. He's been wrong. Uh, he's been the captain of the West Indies for a, for, for a while, maybe five, six, seven years, if my memory serves me right. Um, I know you are not a selector, but of course, I know that Cricket West Indies must talk about this. What's going on in terms of that? Well, I mean, as a West Indian, West Indian fan, uh, West Indies team fan, we, we, we all have been actually disappointed with the performance of our test team, certainly in England, though it was always going to be a very difficult tour. But again, when you play at home against the South Africa team, and we believe that it was a perfect opportunity for us to finally win a, a test series, or uh, win a test match, really, against South Africa. First game, green obviously affected. Yeah. I think we played well to secure during that first one. But the second game in Guyana, we really should have won that. And I'm sure that the coach, the captain, and all the players would be quite disappointed, naturally. Um, but, listen, it is a relatively young team, right? I know we have been saying this for a while now. But Bradford not young? Well, the team, because okay. he's the captain of a young team, right? And if you look at the average matches played by this team, I know. especially the batting unit, and even the bowling unit too, you'd realize that they're an experience. And it's, it certainly cannot be easy, an easy job for Craig Bratton. What I do know, and I could say with great conviction, is that Craig is, Craig is very dedicated to the role. And he wants to do better. He wants to, to he's fully committed. But his captaincy to, style, Dr. Charlo, and sometimes, I, I, it's, it, I know you can't speak to that maybe, yeah. but his captaincy style, and sometimes it feel placement, and well, sometimes well, his well, thinking well, seems well, to well, be well, just so, well, not Andrew, negative, but more well, well, Andrew, laid back, more like reactive. Well, if, if I were to, let's say, put my sure. cricket fan yes. hat on, right? I would argue that, you know, we've been doing fairly well on the, in the field. 
we've been bowling our teams. We've Recently, the answer is yes. Right. Well, it's on the crack. Yes. Right. And so it is not necessary. Our, our weakness at this point is, I won't say it is about, you know, our on field. We could, but we could, we could get him on faster, though. Field. Because against South Africa, we allow the tail enders to make too many runs. 60 runs, yes, right? Yes. And, and so, you know, in, in hindsight and from show and reflection, Craig and the team management, because... Does he take instructions from Andre Coley? That's a lot of people ask that question. In other words, because sometimes you wonder about the on-field discussion it, between a, the... A lot, a lot of times, it's, it's really supposed to be teamwork. You know, yeah. you have an analyst... You have the head coach and the captain, and you know it's in most cases you probably have a, a management team even within the playing eleven, right? Understood. So, so it is you know you would say well yes you're the captain and you, the buck ends with you on the field, but ultimately it doesn't really happen. There, like there, that there are a lot of us as well, Doctor Shallow, and I know I'm asking you a question that you might not be able to answer, but I'm still mm -hmm. going to ask you. There are a lot of us that feel that he says the same things over and over at the end after we've lost. We played well. We just didn't do this. We played well. We didn't feel well today. We played well. We didn't bat well. So you, you do get a sense that, this is my opinion, that he's a decisive, uh, strong captain. Maybe he is, I, but it, you don't outwardly see it. And I think I we're think, seeing his need I, that. I, I think he has the support of his entire team. You know, the players look up to him. He, he worked very Maybe too hard. easy on them, sir? He worked very hard off the field in terms of preparation and so on. He puts in the work, but, you know... His batting has fallen off too as well, eh? He, he may not have been as consistent yeah. um, uh, perform as, as he's like. But I know for sure that he's not giving up. He is quite committed to, to bouncing back, um, finishing the year good again. So he can play. But that's he does want to be the captain. He can play. Well, it's, it's a decision at some point that I suspect Miles and Andre Cody and so on will make. But I, 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 I would be surprised if they change Craig anytime soon, certainly not in this year, right? And I back Craig to lead our team against um, Bangladesh later this year, and I'm, I'm hopeful that we end the year on a successful note. But, you know, he, he has the full support of the I've just seen Bangladesh if need, win, 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 win. They just win, played win, a magnificent win, game, game against it. Pakistan. Yeah, um, so they just played well. But we hope that, you know, things go in our favour in the Caribbean. And between now and then, I suspect Coach Corey will ensure that the team is well prepared for the that test series. We continue here talking with Dr. Shallow. Dr. Shallow, uh, a lot of questions have been raised about uh, the format of selection of the West Indies team. And it appears, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, sir, that Miles Bascom, the director, uh, seems to suggest that Cricket West Indies is going down the route of using a coach to select the team. Is that a fair comment or not? Well, uh, Domas Bascom is the director of cricket. Yes. You know, this decision, this new system um, derived out of discussions with the Cricket Performance and Outcome Committee. All right? This committee is chaired by Director Enoch Lewis. And there are other, you know, very established former cricketers on that committee as well. Ian Bratcher. Um, I think Wavell Hines is a member of Weeper. He's on that committee too. Um, Andy Roberts, I believe, is on that committee as well. And, and a few other individuals. Like yes. Harry, I, sure, Leon, it's okay. Leon, Leon Johnson, who just yeah. retired from first and last cricket and who, have, who has played international cricket as well. So they came up with this system as the, the, the you know, what is most suitable for environment at this current point. And how the system works is that you have the head coach as the lead person in the selection process. And what we believe is with this approach, we'll have more consistency across the system. So as it is previously, as it was, we would have the lead selector who would be selecting a squad, or leading the process of selecting the squad. Then you would have the coach and the captain selecting the playing level. In consultant, well, the, the, the Lead selector was part of that. But you would appreciate that he didn't have the ultimate say with the playing level. The coach, that is? The lead selector. Oh, the lead selector. Previously. Okay, right, okay. Right. Now, th that was contrary to what we wanted because you want consistency. You want that. And, and the coach obviously is in the best position to determine the strategy of the team. So if the coach 
and the coaches have that strategy, established that strategy that brand of cricket you want to play. Then to be relying on someone else to determine who are the best, you know, players to perform those roles and responsibilities in the team, you don't always get the best outcome. And so we we, we believe and we we stand by the system. We 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 have done tremendous research on it as well. Um, so franchises, this is the system that the franchises employ. Um, you have football as a lead example. We've been doing this successfully for many years. And we thought that certainly cricket is it has reached a stage. Even though there is in sorry to cut you, but even though there is insularity, I know you mentioned football and cricket, they don't have insularity, meaning that how the coach comes from a particular country, there are about uh, a number of Caribbean countries involved. And it's going to be one person making a decision, and that person could not dis dislike someone. Whereas in the past, one of the reasons for having two or three persons, it was to prevent this sort of insularity. But now by just one person alone having it. So, so, so that is an excellent point, Andrew. But for this same reason is why the new system we are employing is even more suitable, more practical. Right? It should be more effective. And I'll explain to you why. In a system where you have the lead selector selecting a squad responsibly, then you have the head coach who are given a squad pretty much to select the playing level. It is difficult to hold the head coach accountable, right? Now, because when the team does, and we know this, in the history of our cricket, we blame the selector before we blame anybody else. Of course, right? we do, we do, agreed. And, and so the coaches could easily be, 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 be led to just slide under the radar, while we use the selectors as a scapegoat, right? I've known of times in the past where head coaches, captains will get their way with team selection, and then we still hear the selectors being criticized, whereas the selectors probably was in alignment with what we would pick generally. So in the football system, the, 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 man the managers of the teams who select the players they are held solely responsible for the performance of the team. And so by us empowering the coaches, right, by giving them the, the, the responsibility to select their teams, then you know, they can't point fingers and say, oh, this person didn't give me who I wanted, so I couldn't perform my, I couldn't have my team play according to the brand I wanted to play because I didn't get enough all rounders in my team. I didn't have... Thank you very much. The first part of listening to Dr. Shallow, we take a short break, very short break. When we come back, we finish with Dr. Shallow, the president of Cricket West Indies. We'll be back. To use a fastball and set and so on and so on. The only difference with that I mean, is that in football, for instance, what would happen is if it's just in, the players would have an option to go and play for more than one team. In the right. case of the West Indies, there's only one option. It's only the West Indies. If you don't get picked for the West Indies test team, then you have no other options. Whereas in football, you can play for Chelsea, you can play for Arsenal, you can play for Tottenham. So if one coach will like you, you guarantee the other coach will like you. Here in the Caribbean, it's limited. So you're talking about 14 or 15 players out of a population of 6.5 million. Mm -hmm. So if somebody don't like you, your, your chance is very well, slim. We are in a professional system and we can't necessarily cater. And that is where human capital comes in, right? That and I, I, I believe, and you know, I was in some one or two small quarters, I think a pocket or so of people have, you know, in the attempt to be mischievous, they have probably identified that a few professionals have uh, departed West Indies cricket since my presidency started, right? And, and they made reference to like the commercial director, the oh, CEO, okay, 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 leaving okay. and so on. Sure. I believe that you must have the right people in a system in, in, to ensure that they produce what you, what you desire, right? And so when we set our targets, and if we hire people and merit, Andre, right, Which is what it should always be. It is how it should be. Then yeah. you do not have the issue of having to look over your shoulder and worry about if a coach likes a player or not. Right, because you should recruit coaches or others in the system who are thinking similarly in that they'll only identify and select I, people I think the, merit. the big question, Dr. Shallow, will be 
who will review the performance of the coach? Well, how the regularly will it be? The director because of I think based on what you've just said, yeah. it now becomes incumbent even more than before yeah. to really review. But that is the point, and that is how a system yeah. is going to work. That is the only how you'll have a system working. So if I could hold you accountable for the performance of the team, right? And if the director of cricket was sitting above you, you know, is not reviewing you, then I could hold him responsible as well. And if I am not holding them responsible, then you know the, the public will hold me responsible as shareholders. Naturally. So it creates what we're doing is creating an environment where we could hold each, you know, stakeholder. Have you all explained that to the players, you think? Have you all explained it to the players, to the Caribbean enough? I I, I think that there's so that is one of the reasons we have in a press conference next week. Okay. Um but not next week later this week and yeah. Thursday we have a press conference and Miles Bascom and Derek Cricket he will be explaining the More details. system um, to the public. He also, I think, within, between him and the communication consultant, they are also preparing, you know, like an animation. Okay. You know, to have that out where people have some graphics where people could actually, you know, it could be simplified. Because it's important that we inspire confidence in the people. People must know what the selection system is about. You know, like we, we understand that you know, it's a sensitive area, but even the players and the coaches, the agents and others, they must understand fully. And if they don't, then we have to encourage them to ask questions because we want everyone to understand how the system works. And I mean, it, it, it may not be perfect, but that is life. What we have to do is, although we establish it now, we have to always look at ways, opportunities to fine tune it and improve it even more. So that is where we are now sensitizing the people, players, and everyone in the system about the system, about the selection system. We'll do that. We'll make a similar effort with the press conference and other media releases going out and so on over the coming weeks and, and, and you know, well, days and weeks. Dr. Kishore Shallow, the Caribbean Premier League is due to start next week. The men's portion, the women's portion is going on right now. Uh, Dr. Shallow, when we had uh, the conference hosted by the Honorable Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Keith Christopher Rowley, earlier this year, it was voiced by many of the distinguished persons, including Dr. Rowley and Mia Motley and several others, that the Caribbean Premier League need to find a way to talk with Cricket West Indies and maybe even CARICOM about a change, possible change, to the 50-year contract. Um, uh, and the contract should be shown to the CARICOM, should be shown, and it changes made. Any status on that, sir? Well, we, we haven't had any in-depth discussion since the CARICOM heads of government meeting about the arrangement between CPL and the West Indies. Um, but, you know, Peter Russell, the CEO, has always said that he's quite open to having those discussions. I know there have been some other um, topical discussions taking place around the ownership of CPL and all of that. And we are going to get, in fact, I have a, a meeting with Pete Russell um, two days from now, where we'll sit down and that certainly will, you know, expect it to be on the agenda where we discuss those things. We always have open and frank discussions. So we'll discuss those and another thing. But, I mean, importantly, CPL has started. We, we have enjoyed in Trinidad and Tobago over the last couple of nights, the female, um, John, last, well, last, not the trade, not the trade, night riders fans, they're not so happy. With well, that. last night, they but won, except they, for last they night, won, uh, they won in a super uh, over, some won a super over, a brilliant, <laughs> a brilliant game, uh, yeah. led by skipper DeAndre Dutton. Dutton, yes, you know, it was, uh, I was there witnessing the, the, the game, I stayed until the very last ball, it was exciting cricket. Um, I'm obviously using the opportunity to urge Trinidadians to come out and, and enjoy some of that, and then later on. This week, um, we have the CPL men starting, I think, in, in 29th in Antigua. So that should be pretty, pretty interesting as well. But, but Andrew, don't discount the fact, right? I mean, quite often we zoom into probably potential negatives. But we have to somewhat credit CPL for the success that we are enjoying in T20 cricket currently and over the last year and a half or so. They have made their contributions. And don't forget that executing these tournaments required millions of dollars, right? At the time when the decision was made, it is because 
in, in, in what I believe, good judgment, you realize the cost of CPL was, it, it was not affordable for us to have such T20 tournament across the Caribbean. Now, whereas I join in many to say that I do not agree that it should have been a 50-year agreement, we have certainly, and this started under Ricky Skerritt, bridging the gap between CWI and CPL so that we work more collaboratively, so that there are, there are more neut uh, mutual benefits between the two entities. And with me, I obviously am committed to ensuring that we extract more out of our relationship with them. Um, if it means reducing uh, the, the, the number of years, and don't forget that at the, when we reach 30 year period, we also have an, op an, an option of deciding which direction we go there then. So, so it's after 30? After 30, we, we could negotiate and, and so on. And But one thing I'm pleased with is that the, the executive managers and, and the owners of CPL currently, they are quite open to having a discussion with us. And we have to sit with them. But Andre, I mean, I, I know you will pick out, you will pick out that, that um, one from the conference, but there are other pressing matters that came out of the conference that, you know, we, we are yet to get the opportunity to follow up on. Um, it was a, um, I would say an extraordinary conference where we all got to partake over two days discussing cricket. But it's important that we see actions manifesting. Have, have you spoken to CARICOM that. since? Because, I mean, CARICOM would have, would have hoped, I believe, since that conference that some of this matter with the CPL could have been um, Well, I don't spoken. know if it's just CPL only, because okay. there, there are other things that I believe are more pressing than, than, than the CPL matter, certainly from a regional level, because by all means, CPL is successful, right? Well, Mr. And, Mr. Russell said it was making a loss. Well, but I'm saying, from a Cricket West Indies okay, perspective, fine. Okay. right, from their perspective, they may be making a loss, but from Cricket West Indies perspective, where all players are getting the exposure, or young players are getting opportunities to play, and our fans are being engaged and enjoying the cricket atmosphere and so on. It is a success for us, right? But there are other areas that we need to zoom like in on. Schools cricket. Okay. Right? Schools cricket. We need to strengthen schools cricket. We need to have grassroots cricket up and running. We need to have infrastructure um, improve across the region. Academies established where necessary. And we need to have a sustainable income across the Caribbean. There was a proposal on the table cage, right? that we are hoping that we'll, we'll find favor with the governments, that Cricket West Indies could have this source of income that would make the organization sustainable. It would help us to be able to invest in grassroots cricket and club cricket and all these other areas that we need to strengthen to make is, our international teams is, better. Is this, Dr. Shallow, there's further evidence that we are not getting the amount of money we would like from the ICC? Well, we would certainly love to have more. Right, that is that is no, no doubt, and you know those discussions will continue to to be tabled by by Cricket West Indies, and I'm sure my colleagues at, at, at from other um, developing countries, um, certainly associate members and others too, will, will voice those sort of opinions. But if if we were to say go, go back, if we were to go back to Caricom, which we have a bit more control over, right? I just think that we need to accept that we have to work collaboratively to strengthen our cricket, right? Um, in all fairness, let me, let me put on record that we there were efforts to have meetings, but since the um, conference, um, Beryl came, so we were supposed to meet in Grenada. This is the CPL? No, no, no. With the CARICOM, CARICOM, with CARICOM okay. and the territorial boards. Okay, understand. The heads of the territorial boards. We were supposed to meet to continue the discussions and right. to get some actions coming out of the conference. Uh, when the meeting was scheduled, for was CARICOM heads of government meeting in Grenada. Hurricane Barry came and that was postponed. Another attempt was made and, you know, it didn't manifest, unfortunately. But I know Prime Minister um, Dr. Keith Rowley, he, is, um, he, he has said to me that he wants to have this meeting preferably before the end of September. So we are hopeful that by then, mm -hmm. by the end of September, um, we could have this discussion so that in the final quarter of this year, we could realize some of those things discussed at the conference. Dr. Shalo, as we go here, recently we just came out of the Paris Olympics. Come 2028, we have been told 
that cricket will be part of the Olympics. Many of us in the Caribbean are now wondering which team will represent the West Indies. The West Indies obviously cannot play in the Olympics, very much like how England can't play, Scotland can't play, it's the Great Britain have a team. So therefore, uh, have you all given any thought to what would be the process? Sir? Well, let me, let me start that, you know, similar to other mm -hmm. sports fans across the region, how proud we are of all our athletes who represented the region at the Olympics in France. Um, we saw some exceptional performance. Um, I think they really represented the region well. Um, to add cricket to the to the agenda, you know, um, in in the next Olympics, that certainly is going to be something tremendous for us, as we did in the I think it was the Commonwealth Games a couple of years ago, where we had one of our teams represented female. That is, yes, we at the time chose our original women's tournament. The, the winner at the time was Barbados, and so they represented the region. Understand. We we anticipate something similar will be done unless they tell us all the teams could could, could come and participate, which would be ideal, right? Um, so every country in the Caribbean could send a team. That 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 Andre is what we we'll probably love, of right? But um, it's unlikely for that to happen. We have been in discussion with CPL yes. for them to fund. A domestic T20 tournament okay. starting next year. I think Miles Baskin and his team have already scheduled a window for that next year, that is 2025. Once we are able to have that tournament, then we could use that to determine which team or teams will participate in the Olympics on behalf of Cricket West Indies. I think that was the concern for most of us was that you'll have to get the permission of CPL to do that, given this current CPL contract. So that's why we were wondering what's going to happen in terms of that. Right, and of course, as you, you know, we can't use the CPL as it is now yeah. because it's franchises. Yeah. But in the domestic tournament that we are having, which they still have a little commercial model to it, okay. but not to the extent of CPL, you know, and so on. Um, we'll use that. So that will more than likely be territories instead of franchises. And so we'll be able to identify you know, represent. What we don't know at this point is how many teams will be allowed from the Caribbean or from the West Indies. Um, but within due course, um, I'm already in discussion with um, those um, President Keith Joseph and so on from Canuck and the other en entities in the Caribbean that associated with um, Olympics to ensure that we get full support and we could get full representation as well. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Shalom. Much thanks earlier on to Giselle Ramos. This has been WESN Content Capital Face of Sports. Great work as usual, done by the hardworking Neil, uh, Josh Rodney, Keaton, uh, Sean Michael Small. The absent Rodney will hopefully return. And of course, the hardworking Neil doubling up again along with Josh. Goodbye. W-E-S-N.